chat has given me the signal for all systems go. So good afternoon and welcome again to the Kansas and the World War II class. I want to congratulate you guys. I am... one word, all lowercase. Um, that's Rebecca Jane Tanner with T-A-N-N-E-E-R at gmail.com. So, you know, if there are other stories that are kind of prompt your memory this week, feel free to send them to me. Um, I was so impressed with just the rich stories that you came up with. So thank you very much. The second thing I wanted to address is that since last week, um, it has become um, more of a, a uh, important thing for people to understand that um, there need to be uh, face coverings for all students, faculty, staff, and visitors to all the W to wear face coverings um, over their mouths and noses while on Wichita State University campuses um, in all the hallways, public spaces, classrooms, and common areas of the campus buildings. Um, and as you note, I'm wearing a face shield today. Um, because of that. And so I just want you guys to be aware of that. And um, that's kind of where we are on that. To start the today's class out, I uh, invited a dear friend of mine, Stan Finger, to share the stories of his father. Um, and his father, well, I'll let T Stan tell the story. But if that name, Stan Finger, rings a bell with you, it's because uh, Stan um, worked with me at the Wichita Eagle. And one of the things that I always felt um, kind of honored to be working at the Eagle and to work with people such as Stan Finger, who is so gifted and talented in writing. And um, he would tell these wonderful stories uh, about his dad. And so, Stan, are you with us? Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. This is like a, a Verizon commercial almost. <laughs> no, Verizon, which, which yeah. cell phone? Can you hear oh, me now? Yeah. Okay, all right. Tell us a little bit about your dad. Who did he fight alongside with? His company commander was Audie Murphy, who was the most decorated soldier in U.S. military history. He was assigned to um, company. Hold on, Stan. We had to raise the volume. And I just wanted to make sure, who was it that he fought with? Audie Murphy. Are you hearing yeah, me better now? That guy. Okay. Yeah, he's the most decorated soldier in U.S. military history. And Dad's first day on the front lines was the day of the battle uh, in which Murphy, uh, his exploits earned the Medal of Honor. In fact, Dad arrived at that battle scene in Holtzvier, a small town uh, in France, literally minutes after the, the battle ended because the um, tanks and the uh, anti-personnel um, vehicles, they were still burning and the wounded and dead were still on the 
you know, on the ground in the field or whatever, in the woods and on the roads. And dad told me um, we were able to go back to, to Europe to retrace his combat path as part of his attempt to recover from the PTSD he brought home from the war. We walked the same route he did to, to join his unit uh literally just after that battle ended and he said you could hear the wounded moaning and groaning both germans and americans and he thought to himself i'll never make it home alive and the uh, uh, sergeant that was with them leading them to the where their unit was could tell they were all spooked because he said don't worry boys they're not all this bad you'll make you, you know don't worry you're going to be okay because he could tell um the aftermath of that battle was so intense that, that the replacements were getting pretty spooked. So, wow. but then he ended up serving with, um, under Murphy, uh, until Murphy was sent back a few months later, but then dad was on the front lines until he was wounded shortly before the, the, um, war ended or VE day took place in May. So. Okay, and the photo that's on the screen is of your dad in his military uniform. It looks like, Maybe in front of the family house. Yeah, that was taken before he left for um, just before he was left for basic training in Camp Robinson. I think it was either just before he um, went for basic training or between when he got done with basic training and he was shipped overseas. But yeah, that's that's the, the family farm there north and, and west of Larned in Pawnee County. All right. Now, there's another couple of photos that we have for you specifically. Um, can you switch to them, Tat? Okay, that's a head and shoulders shot of your dad. And is there another one? Audie Murphy. Okay. Yeah, that's him with all his... his um, dad was not initially a BA... He, he became known as a BAR man, Browning out automa Automatic Rifle. But he was just a, your garden variety infantry man until a... a about two weeks into his frontline duty because the BAR man, the casualty rate for them was unusually high. The Germans recognized that the firepower of a unit could be cut in half if they eliminated the BAR. So they went through a lot of uh, BAR guys and not everybody could carry one of those because they were kind of a, a large um, submachine gun, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, they would have um, tripods on the end of the uh, barrel so you could lay it flat and and spray intense rounds of fire on the on the enemy. And dad found out that that's how the Germans would find out who's got the BAR because it looked different than the rest of the rifles. So being the um, Kansas farmer ingenuity type, he took the uh, tripod off and made his BAR look very much like any other M1 so he would not stand out in the crowd. And they would pick the BAR guy based on who was strong enough to carry it because it was a lot heavier than the typical M1. And he was 6'5", 160 pounds, but because he'd grown up on a farm and did a lot of manual labor, he was really strong and learned to handle the, the BAR very quickly. And Audie recognized that and would, would take him on special missions behind enemy lines, like for recon or other things like that, because dad was really quick with the trigger and... and uh, um, if he didn't hit it, he said, if I didn't hit my target with the first round of fire, I did with my second. I just I had to learn Excellent. to do it that well. So Adi would always look for him when, when he knew things were going to get tough. Excellent. Now, Tad, can you switch to my PowerPoint? Um, and again, it's the first photo of, of your dad. Let's go to the second photo if we can, whenever you're ready. Um, and a couple of things that are... Uh, students might be interested in knowing um we can go to the next slide on that if if you want um who was it who married your folks oh um some priest father, Capon, Amo, father Amo Capon. yes he uh, is now under consideration for uh priest uh sainthood by the which uh by the vatican by rome they happened to be mom's parish priest in timpkin in 1948 when they got married and he was out there because Timken was a a Czech settlement where Bohemian was the primary language. English was the second language. In fact, there were many families there who didn't speak much English at all. So they needed a, a priest there who could hear confessions in, in Czech or Bohemian. So Father Capon was transferred there from Pilsen 
to uh, Timken and, and he was there for their wedding when they got married in 48 after the war. Uh, it was the only double wedding he ever um, celebrated as a priest. Neat. Okay, so your parents, uh, you and your parents were able to retrace your your dad's steps in Germany. What year and was France, that? 2002. Okay. That's, that's, that's dad there next to that monument there. That's the, a monument to Audie Murphy that was uh, constructed in the woods where the battle took place. And dad's standing there um, in the, you know, next to it. And, and uh, the house is where dad was born outside of Odin on a farm back in 1924. And as part of his combat experience, dad stormed the Siegfried line with his units, the, the row of line of pillboxes that went for hundreds of kilometers uh, along the German border, the, the Western German border. And he helped take a pillbox and we were trying to find that pillbox and it drove dad crazy because he just, that was very important to him, I guess, because so many um, intense moments happened there. And so when uh, Germans in the area found out what we were doing, they spontaneously put together a, a, a meeting with us within a matter of hours. They pulled together experts and maps and photos and said, go to this house, we'll give you the directions. And they cooked us a meal and brought out wine and everything and, and uh, historic photos. You can see Hitler touring the construction of Siegfried Line there in that photo. And actually um, the one above it as well is, is just photos of, of the work in progress. And that we were trying to look, find the actual pillbox. But the, the challenge with that was after the war ended, the Germans were so determined to erase any um, physical reminders of the Nazi period that they blew up or buried virtually every pillbox that, that remained along that uh, defensive fortification. So we were not able to find the actual pillbox when we were planning a second trip to see if we could have more success because they sent me more maps and more information to help us after we got back to the States. And we were planning the second trip when he had his stroke and died. So Okay. And we can go to the next slide now too. Um and that's yeah, see, that's that. That's the meeting I'm talking about there. Okay. Um, one of the that's the post, a local postmaster who was a, a local historian and expert on the on the Siegfried line because they. Okay. They and then the, the next slide is. Oh, that's Father Capon there. Yes, yeah, and in the, the wedding marriage photo and all of that. I want to end, Stan, forgive me for kind of pushing you on, but we have like, there were more than 50 responses from students who shared stories and stuff. So I no, want to kind of get to them. Um, that's fine. But I wanted you to tell about when your mom drove your dad to the, was it the Hoisington Depot? Yeah. For him to go fight, right? Right. Well, this was in late December after um, after they'd gone to uh, he'd gone through basic training and they he, he was sent back because he, he was part. They were both part of a wedding in, in a wedding and they really um, they weren't engaged or anything like that. They just started dating. But he asked her if he'd wait for it because they both kind of knew this one's pretty special. And I've told family members and others um, there was a snowstorm that delayed the troop train that was scheduled to pick him up. And so they waited at the depot for hours on the, I mean, the, the train was supposed to be there at midnight, but it didn't get there till two 30 or three. So they were waiting for hours in that cold depot, just, you know, uh, mom wondering, you know, will I ever see him again? Is he going to make it home? I mean, they were both devout Catholics and praying hard and, and that, that continued throughout. But I just sat there remembering or thinking, man, you're, you're in that depot early in the morning of a December, cold December night, a snowstorm had just happened, wondering if I'm ever going to see him again. And those are just much different times than they are now, because, you know, even when their families are separated by, you know, military families are separated by deployments and stuff, they've still got email and set phones and things like that, which, you know, didn't exist back then. So you were lucky if you got a letter every now and again, and that was the extent of the communication. Excellent. And how long were they married? 50, um, 
58 years. 58 years. That he died in 2006, incredible. yeah. That is incredible. Well, you guys, I want you to thank Stan for joining us today. Thank you so much, Stan. You bet. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about what some of the things you sent in. And I want as many of you here um, that sent stories and also that may have stories that they weren't able to send to feel free to share those stories. Um, we can go to the next slide, Tad. Um, of Norman Coda, um, Eric Engstrom had suggested we explore him, and he uh, was a major general. Um, he was a senior United States Army officer who fought during World War II. Um, he was involved in the planning and execution of the Allied invasion of Normandy, and it was codenamed Operation Neptune, and then the Battle of Normandy. And he's most famous for rallying the demoralized troops on Omaha Beach. Um, let's see, a couple of things that um, I, I just think he's an interesting guy. He uh, trained, I think he later went on to, um, I think he, he lived here in Wichita for some time. I could be wrong on that. Uh, I wish Eric was here. I don't see him. Um, to where he could add some to that. Um, but um, anyway, um, Gail Smith um, had forwarded a story of, is she here by chance? Um, she had forwarded a story uh, that was sent to her in 2009 by her aunt Winsome, who, um, and she titled it A Sad Story. Some of you may have received that as an email um, that was sent out earlier today. I, good, you've got it. Okay, good. Um, and it is an incredible story, and I hope you at your own leisure can read that, but I just think it's an excellent example of how in war um, a lot can happen. Um, Let's see, Julius Holmes is another character um, who was um, born in Kansas, went to KU. Um, he married um, some of you, the Allen Lamb house uh, that was the Frank Lloyd Wright designed house in College Hill. Um, Julius Holmes married Henrietta, the um, Allen's daughter. And so, um, but he was responsible for handling General de Gaulle for General Eisenhower and uh, was given uh, credit for convincing Eisenhower to open up the uh, arsenals to de Gaulle's forces during the liberation um, and thus preventing a French communist takeover. Um, but he then lived in Wichita in later years. Um, he did everything. Um, he was born at Pleasanton. He served as a foreign service officer, um, an officer with the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, he was an assistant secretary of state, uh, served in the American Embassy in London, uh, then was with the State Department and ambassador to to Iran in 1955. Um, just incredible the things that, that he did. Um, we have, it's a segment from BBC. Do we have that so we could listen to it, Tat? Of a, it's of a Kansas farm boy um, and his recollection of Pearl Harbor. Um, and it was broadcast a few years ago. It's a wonderful witness account.
Rugby from the BBC World Service. This week, we're looking back at key moments in the Second World War in the Pacific, which ended 75 years ago. And we start in December 1941, when Japan first drew the United States into the war with the surprise air raid on the US naval base at Pearl Harbor. In 2015, Simon Watts spoke to Adolf Kuhn, a survivor of the attack. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Everywhere you, I looked, there were ships there. There was explosions going on, and there was ships were sinking. I could see that some of them leave to the starboard side, and some leave to the port side. It was a nightmare, nightmare all the way through. Adolf Kuhn was working as a mechanic for the U.S. Navy when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. The son of wheat farmers from the Midwest, he'd volunteered enthusiastically a year earlier. I joined the Navy at 18 years old. Pretty soon the word came up on the bulletin board, we need people for Sitka, Alaska, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and Pearl Harbor, and my hand went up for the Pearl Harbor one. <laughs> Base was just, everywhere you looked were sailors. I enjoyed all my duties, you know what I mean? Took the bus and went into Honolulu or Waikiki Beach, mm -hmm. went to the dances, took in all the different stores and bought souvenirs. I sent souvenirs to all my family in Kansas. Every time I see something new. The Japanese planned their assault for a Sunday morning because they knew many of the sailors would be off base and off duty. Japan had it all figured out. <laughs> mm -hmm. They knew when to hit and they knew that that's why they picked Sunday because Sunday was church day and fun day. Fun. I was on my way to church. Two sailors came along in a Model A4 and they said, get in, Mac, we're at war and they started heading for the Pearl Harbor Navy base. And I'm sitting in the back and the bullets came down on the road down, all the way down the road, all the way around the little car. Not a bullet hit us. Oh God, they were so close there. The, the landing gear was touching the top of the palm trees. So you could see how low they were. That's why we could see their rings and their wristwatches and all that. that that's how low they were, yeah. I looked ahead and a Marine, the Marine got his head blown off. And I said a prayer for him because it was church morning. And when Adolf reached the water's edge, he found a scene straight from hell. And I got out and I start running to my boat landing. All the boat docks and everything was all on fire, burning from the oil that's in the water, you know. I saw the American flag up there on fire on the USS Nevada. And uh, the guys on the ships were jumping into the water and swimming for refuge, you know what I mean? Because their ships were sinking. Everywhere you look, some ship was having problems. And still, the Japanese kept coming in wave after wave. As well as the Nevada, their bombers struck the California and the Oklahoma as they sat in dock. And then a Japanese bomb ignited ammunition stores on the USS Arizona. When that ship exploded, a big chunk about the size of a garbage can lid came all across the Pearl Harbor Channel and touched my right earlobe. Now, mind you, if it missed over a couple of inches, I'd have been beheaded, see? And somebody with a megaphone, we need help to go aboard these ships here. To, all these poor guys are still in their skivvies. So I said, I'm heading for the Arizona. It was all lopsided and everything and all that and all the hand railing was burned out and all that and I had to grab the railing and I finally made my way up and by the time I got up on top a lot, my shoe soles were smoking because the steel was so hot on top and there was five bodies, five guys up there. 
all burned out. Their own mothers wouldn't recognize them. And pretty soon I heard, oh, and I looked and there was one guy over by the gun turret. And I walked over to him and he fell over against the gun turret and St. Peter called him home too. So that's the way it went all day long. Then Adolf went to the aircraft hangar where he usually worked. Caught by surprise, most of the pilots hadn't even managed to take off. And now the Japanese were destroying the warplanes of the Pacific fleet as they stood on the tarmac. And I start crawling in that airplane hangar and I crawled under the welding bench and drained my shoes. My oil was running out of my shoes and I'm all covered. And here I'm thinking I'm the only guy in the building. And all of a sudden the bomb came crashing through the roof and tore the purlins out and all that stuff. And it landed about from here to the door in front of me, it landed on the concrete and stood there and wavered. And all of a sudden, a voice from the far end of the building said, let's get the hell out of here before she blows. Once outside the hangar, Adolf tried desperately to drag his planes out of the firing line. And now uh, here I am, a Kansas farmer, a tractor driver, and they were all on fire. Mm -hmm. The tires were burning off. The machine guns in the cockpit were going off, you know. So I yelled for somebody to get a cable or so for me to tow them planes down to the bone yard, which is a scrap pile, you know. And I got on this little Minneapolis Moline tractor, little orange tractor, and I'm heading on down the runway. And just as I'm getting fairly close to where I'm going to drop it off, a Japanese pilot came overhead, and I saw his Bombay doors open. And when I saw that, I said to myself, Adolf, this is it. I really did. And the bomb came and it went into the concrete runway and it threw chunks of steel the size of a Volkswagen with a reinforcing steel rebar, big chunks landing on top of the trees, landing on top of the buildings, landing on top of the barracks. All that landed on me was little tiny pebbles go bing, 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 bing. So the guardian angel was looking after me. You know that. All that explosions going on and all that death going on everywhere and me and being in total safety, that's unheard of, you know. I am still alive after 19 close calls. I'm still alive. So I have to have a guardian angel here. There's no other way. It's not just, it's not just say, oh, it's just one of those things, you know, that happens. <laughs> By the end of the Pearl Harbor attack, about 2,500 American servicemen lay dead, almost half of whom had been on board the battleship Arizona. The next day, the US Congress declared that America was now at war with Japan. Adolf Kuhn spoke to me for witness history in 2015. He died in California in 2018 at the age of 96. That edition of Witness History was written and presented by Simon Watts. And in tomorrow's program, the former Star Trek actor George Takei recounts his experience of being imprisoned in an internment camp as a child during World War II because Japanese Americans were seen as a potential threat to U.S. security. And if you'd like to hear more of our first-hand accounts from the past... Look for Witness Excellent. I just thought you might... Um enjoy hearing from a Kansas farm boy, his account. Um, let's go ahead to the next slide whenever you can get that up. And um, in the meantime, I heard again, I, keep, I cannot stress that enough from so many of you, is um, Wallace Jensen in the audience today? Well, he sent in a story, and I'm going to read it for you. I hope this is okay that I go ahead and read your stories. In near zero, zero visibility on May 3rd, 1943, a B-24 Liberator bomber crashed into Iceland's Mount Fegredzolfel, I mispronounced it, so please forgive me, carrying the commanding general of U.S. Army Europe, Frank Andrews, and his staff. All were killed, along with the plane's crew, except for the tail gunner. General Andrews had been directed to return from Europe to be named Supreme Allied Commander of all forces in Europe. 
the role then given to Dwight D. Eisenhower to lead the buildup and invasion of Europe on D-Day. So, what if? To add to the tragedy of the event, ironically, the B-24 was returning to the U.S. being the first heavy bomber to complete its mission without being shot down. Radar stations were installed along the mountain slopes watching the movement of German ships. My father was a radar technician charged with daily maintenance, which meant traversing the terrain daily to assure operation. 23 months he did this, no furlough. Often night above the Arctic Circle meant staying overnight with the equipment to stay warm. Many of the soldiers climbed their way to the crash site. In idle time in the base shop, my father formed a ring from a piece of metal of the aircraft that my daughter wears around her neck. Isn't that interesting? Um, this is from uh, Joaquin Santos. My name is Joaquin Santos. I am a recently retired physician, which allows me time to take courses and read all the books that I have been collecting over my 70 plus years. I am one of your online students. I enjoyed your first session on Thursday. I would like to tell you my family's connection to World War II and subsequently Kansas. They are entwined by history and circumstance. My family's connection to World War II revolves primarily with our father, but ultimately his wife and children as well. My father was born on the island of Guam, um, and since the Spanish-American War in 1898, Guatemalans are born American citizens, as are the citizens of other territories. He was born in 1917, and was an adolescent and teenager during the Great Depression. Like so many young men on the island, as well as the mainland, with little educational or vocational opportunities, he joined the Navy with his brother in 1938. On December 7, 1941, he and his brother were crew members of the USS Nevada, docked with the other Pacific Fleet battleships in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. According my, to my father, it was a quiet, quiet early Sunday morning with very little activity until all hell broke out. He told me that he was below deck when he heard the noise above and heard all hands on deck. This is not a drill. The Nevada was the sister ship of the USS Arizona, just a little over 50 feet apart. As everyone knows, the Arizona suffered a fatal bomb to its munition stores and sub subsequently sunk in its dock. The first time I visited Pearl Harbor, I was shocked by just how close all the battleships were docked. I realized that before those 50 feet, my siblings and I would not be here. Fascinatingly, the Nevada was the only battleship that had maneuverability that morning. Their captain attempted to get the ship out of the harbor, but the Japanese were attempting to sink it in the mouth of the harbor, thus blocking entry or exit for any ships. After relentless strafing, the captain decided to beach the Nevada in front of the base's hospital, thus saving the lives of many sailors, including my dad and uncle. A couple of sides, if I might. All of the battleships were eventually repaired and recommissioned with the exception of the Arizona, of course, and the Oklahoma, which sank in the Pacific as it was being towed to the mainland for repairs. The Nevada survived the war and was subsequently sunk for target practice in 1948. The wreck was found just a few months ago, about 65 miles from Pearl Harbor. Interestingly, on July 8, 1941, the Japanese invaded Guam and occupied it for some time before it was retaken. I remember reading that even into the 1960s, Japanese soldiers would come out of the jungle having been told they were never to surrender. 
After the war, my father continued his naval career throughout the 40s and 50s. My parents met after the war and like so many other post-war couples, married and started their families. My brother and I were born at the Great Lakes Naval Training Station north of Chicago. Three of my sisters were born at the Philadelphia Naval Station. In 1954, my dad received orders that he was being transferred to a small naval air station in Hutchinson, Kansas. My mother was French Canadian, her parents having immigrated from Quebec to Old Town, Maine in the 1910s. By the time they arrived in Hutchinson, they had five young children, I being the oldest. My mother made it clear that she was, um, she was, uh, this was to be her, her last move. And my father, in fact, received subsequent transfer orders to other duty stations and other ships over the years. My other, mother always left the home fires burning for him. When I was growing up, I remember a reporter from the Hutchison News would come and talk with my father, as did reporters from other or our local radio stations and from Channel 12, which was the first of our local television stations. I don't know for sure, but I think he was a particularly good interview. He was fairly quiet and tended to talk about military discipline more than he did about the experiences. Anyway, um, I just thought that was an interesting story to share. Um, Evelyn Gregg, are you here by chance? Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, ah, yes, this is Robert Budge. Um, he was from St. John and uh, was the father of a good friend of mine, Jill Bowden. She sent this in. It is a collage of the photos he was in. Um, he was a pilot, and he was one of those that went off ships and all those kind of things. He... Um, was able to to get through World War II, also served in the Korean War. Um, he was killed when he after he came home from service. He was driving a fuel truck, and uh, some hunters in western Kansas uh, ran a stop sign and um, ran into his truck, and he was killed within the truck. Um, but he was an incredible man that gave lots of service and. Uh, had a pretty interesting career. Evelyn Gregg, um, let's see, what's the next slide that we have? Okay, that's Coy Allen's. I'm gonna read maybe a couple more, and then I wanna ask if there are anyone, if there's any folks here, I know there are, uh, who would like to share some of their stories. We're gonna take a small break after I read a couple of more stories. I also want to call your attention to the photo in front of me. It's the USS Wichita during the wartime, and I thought you guys might like to see that. Um, Evelyn Gregg, she contributed this story. Um, family connections to World War II and how it affected the family. Your mention of Louis Siegendaler during the lecture sparked a memory for me and my husband, my cousin Charles uh, Correll, a noted chemist, also worked on the Manhattan Project. Um, Charles Dubois Coriel was an American chemist who was one of the discoverers of the element promethium. Uh, he was among the Manhattan Project scientists who in 1945 um, signed the petition using pres urging President Harry Truman not to use the first atomic bomb without restriction. Um, this is a letter that was sent to the family after the passing of his wife, Grace Mary Sally Coriel. Uh, we always heard that she committed suicide from having to live with the idea of her husband's involvement with the atomic bomb. In the letter, it states that she had a heart attack brought on by the strain of World War II. Um, 
Mrs. Charles D. Coriel passed away yesterday at Mount Auburn Hospital in Cambridge, Massachusetts, after 10 days of unconsciousness following heart stoppage, April 25th. She died a victim of pressures of the Cold War. She was 50 and a half years old. Mrs. Coriel was the former Grace Mary Selly of Colorado Springs, who came in 1935 to live with her uncle, the late Edward G. Thomas of Los Angeles, California, after the early deaths of her mother, Grace Louise Thomas Seeley, and of her father, Frank Seeley. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, she, since 1966, she has lived in Lexington, Massachusetts, with her husband, who is professor of chemistry at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Before her marriage, Miss Seeley had received recognition as a poet of promise with 15 poems in print, two more items than her bridegroom had as scientific papers in print. Uh, she wrote very little after 1936, being engulfed with pressures of the world of science and war. Uh, her only major poem in the letter period of her life was written in August 1945 after receiving a color photo of the Almogordo bomb test of July 17, 1945. It is titled, On My Mantle, There is a Picture of the Atomic Bomb. It is like an unanswered telegram. Um, just an interesting note. Um, a second family connection, also a distant cousin to my husband, husband was David Schilling. Salina Regional Airport was the site of the former Schilling Air Force Base, previously known as the Smoky Hill Army Airfield and Smoky Hill Air Force Base. Um, I just think that's interesting. Are you guys in the mood to take a break right now? Would you like to do that? Let's do that and we'll come back afterwards. All right? Thank you.
All right, I've been given the all systems go sign. So um, let's come back. And I, I wanted to back up just a little in terms of the uh, collage that Jill Bowden sent in. Um, here is some background info on her father, Lieutenant James Robert Budge. He went to William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri, and graduated from 1943, graduated in 1943 as a Naval Aviation Cadet. And after graduating from St. John High School in 1941, he received his pilot wings, Naval Aviator from the Naval Air Training Center at Corpus Christi. Uh, in July 1944, then on to flying during World War II and was recalled to service for the Korean War. And so I just, I wanted to make sure that we had that on record. Um, Pat T. Meyer uh, sent in this story that her father was born, and is she here by chance? Uh, I think she might be online. Anyway, her, uh, her father was born in 1918. He joined the Navy right out of high school. He was a Lieutenant JG during World War II. He was stationed in the South Pacific. When he came back from the war, he suffered from anxiety and panic attacks. The panic attacks seemed to get better, but he suffered from anxiety and depression for the rest of his life. I guess nowadays we call that PTSD. He smoked to keep, to keep calm. He managed to have a successful medical practice, but in later years, he started self-medicating to cope. He was a good father. Sometimes I would hear him wandering the house at night trying to relax, or he would sit in his recliner and read until he could fall asleep. I don't think this affected me so much as a child. I just thought that's the way dads were. But as I got older and realized what was going on, I started worrying more about him. And I know my mother felt she had to be stronger for him. Towards the end, he just gave up trying to cope and died. His death made us angry because we felt like he should have fought harder. But I think the war just ruined life for him. I read that because I think there are some... Um, I mean, I just think the war affected people in so many different ways. And there weren't any right or wrong ways. It affected people. And I think in many ways it also affected um, the children and sometimes grandchildren um, after the fact. So um, I was really uh, very appreciative of Patricia for sending that in. Coy Allen, I love when he takes my classes because he always sends such great material. And um, can we back up one slide? Because I think that's of his dad's. Um, there we go. As early, and this is Coy's account. I know he's taking this online. Um, he wrote that as early as fall, winter of 1942, my dad was involved in the war effort during dirt work for POW camp in Tonkawa, Oklahoma. Early in the war, my dad was very saddened by the combat death of his first cousin, Tom Allen. Dad told us that Tom and several of his buddies were shot to death by Japanese while sleeping in their bunks. I remember the end of the war with Germany. The Liberty UMC Church bell rang and people gathered in the street for um, and or Federal Highway number 169. I remember ration food and tires. I saw black market tires coming from Wichita to um, our county and changing hands. My dad was drafted in the Marine Corps. Mom and dad thought he was being drafted into the Navy. My dad was short and stocky built. The story dad told was of a long line of sailors to be with a couple Marine officers standing nearby. There were two or three draftees standing behind the Marine officers. When the line worked my dad up to the Marine officers, one of them called out to him and said, come here, shorty, you'd make a good Marine. 
mom and dad's formal picture taken in a portrait studio. Mom made Navy uniforms for my brother and myself before we knew he was to be a Marine. Mom, we two boys, and a neighbor soldier wife headed to California to be with my dad. Mom and our, our family just knew dad would be fighting in the Pacific Theater Island, hopping or invading Japanese homeland. The odds of being killed were pretty good. As a family, we were thankful that President Harry Truman decided to drop the atomic bomb. And Coy's from Montgomery County, so I just thought I would share that with you. Um, this was a portion of a letter that his mom sent in September of 1944. Spent second grade in a California church basement due to the tremendous influx of soldiers, teachers, was invariably late to class. Several of us, this is Coy's account, several of us second graders decided to lock the teacher out of the basement. Our punishment was to be paraded around the school classmen with ring binder circle reinforcement pieces stuck all over our, our faces. Oh, the memories. I love that. Um, let's see. I think we have... Um, Marie Glispie, would you mind coming up and talking about this next slide? Um, can you get us to um, the next slide, Tat? There we go. And that is President Obama's connection to uh, Kansas. And Marie, tell them what you did. I was on a committee in El Dorado where our main purpose was to uh, research Obama's Kansas roots. Uh, we didn't care what each other's political affiliation was. We just did it for history. And we found that the uh, roots were very deep here in Kansas. If you're interested, I'll give you two websites you can look up. Uh, the committee developed a report, and we sent copies to the African American Museum in D.C. We sent a copy at the White House. There's a copy in the Historical Museum at Augusta, one at Butler Co Community College, and it's Obama, Kansas, heritage.org. Okay, but let's back up just a second. Who was he related to? He was related <laughs> to, and it, <clears throat> most of you may know that his grandparents grew up in our area. Madeline Payne, his grandmother, was born in Augusta. His grandfather, Stanley Dunham, was born and raised in El Dorado. And they met in Wichita, as I understand. His grandmother uh, was a Rosie the Riveter at Boeing. Um, let's see. And his mother's name was? His what? Mother's, mother's name, name was? was Stanley Ann. Okay. And she was born at St. Francis. Uh, but they didn't live here long because Stanley had kind of restless feet and they moved a lot. But uh, there's another website that might be interesting to you. We traced back. Uh, that he has in nine different cemeteries in Kansas, some ancestors are buried. Um, let's see, Lenexa, Olathe, El Dorado, Peru, Winfield, two in Wichita. And uh, there is a website where there is a fantastic photographer that lives in Lenexa, but he uh, loves to take photos of many different areas, but he uh, has this particular website on the photos of Obama's ancestors' grave sites, and it is uh, kansastravel.org. Okay. But then the forward slash Obama Kansas and ancestors, and that'll get to you to pictures of the website. Excellent. If you click on the name, which is highlighted of each person you will get more text. His family, the Dunham side, originally started in Ohio, then moved to Indiana when the Osage, uh, the Miami Indian lands became open for settlement. Then when the Osage la uh, land became open in Southeast Kansas, a bunch of the Indiana folks moved to Southeast Kansas. The okay. same happened with Madeline's family 
they were from Arkansas and Missouri. Several of them moved to Southeast Kansas, and that's where uh, the original family members met each other. Excellent. Thank you very much. You I, I appreciate you sharing that. Can I give the, the website again if anybody sure. missed it, or is it okay? Did everyone get the websites? Did you want me to repeat? The one on our research is Obama Kansas Heritage. Dot org. The one for the photos of the grave sites is kansastravel.org forward slash Obama Kansas Ancestors. Excellent. Thank you very much. Robert Bell had sent in this account, and you know, I have to say I, I so appreciated it because I was born in 1956, and you're wondering, my gosh, how could I be affected so much by World War II? But we were. It, it had a profound effect on our parents. And, and um, so anyway, he sent, uh, in regards to World War II, I have little to share. I was born in 1955, so I may be, I hope, one of the younger people in the room. Oh, no, Robert, you're not. Of course, my experience is what my parents told me. They may not have been entirely candid about, candid about it as they were teenagers. My father mainly talked about listening to radio broadcasts of FDR, whom his parents adored, and his cousin who was injured in the leg during the campaign to retake Italy. My father, or my mother, mainly remembered the war rationing, especially sugar, and they both talked of growing a vegetable garden at home. I mean, that's something I can very much relate to. Cleo Rucker sent in some wonderful stories. Um, I would, uh, he says, um, Joyce, his wife, was born in 1934, but in the little German Mennonite community of Bueller. She told me that during World War II, whenever the family went to Hutchinson for shopping, her parents told the family to make sure they always spoke English and not German, which was the language they spoke in homes, church, and other places in Bueller. She said they never had any problems, but they just wanted to make sure there were none. You had asked about our education. Joyce and I both graduated from Wichita University in 1956, um, and they went on. He had a teaching fellowship from Ohio University, and she was a specialist in, in elementary, or he was a specialist in elementary education in 1976 from WSU. Um, and she also graduated with her master's in 1985. Um, and they're watching from home uh, in Derby. Um, he said, not having taken any of your classes before, I'm not sure how long or short these stories should be, so I will just ramble on and let you use whatever you want or don't want. I love the frankness on that. Anyway, Cleo Rucker was born in 1934 in the thriving metropolis of Vermilion, Kansas. My parents owned a general store, and to make a long story much shorter, the D Great Depression was not very good to them. Traveling salesmen would come through town selling their wares and eventually convince my dad he should move us to Wichita, where the real money was to be made. We packed up and in 1942 lit in Wichita, where Dad tried to get work at Boeing. Unsuccessful, he went to work at Dillon's as a meat cutter, and at night at Aero Parts, located where Metropolitan Baptist Church now sits. They noticed his work ethic and sent him to school to get a GED, and then on to Boeing as a quality control inspector. 
He must not have done a very good job because of what you mentioned in class. Many of the planes were not in very good shape when they came off the line and had to be sent to other bases to become ready to be sent into action. Well, that's not true, Cleo. They were in good shape, but they just had not been designed for war. So they needed to, to be shaped up for war. Um, but anyway, because dad now worked for Boeing, we were eligible, eligible to live in Plainview. And in 1943, moved into one of the two-story, three-bedroom quad units that are no longer there. We thought it was a mansion. Plainview at that time had all the necessities that a big city had, mainly a movie theater, five cent and 12 cent tickets, and a free merry-go-round. My dad was asked many times why he was never drafted, and it was not because he was not old enough for World War I and too old for, it was because he was not old enough for World War I and too old for World War II. You may remember reading about the pandemic that was scaring everyone at the time, polio. Unfortunately, I was one of the unlucky ones that came down with this disease and ended up in St. Francis Hospital where they thought this could be cured with hot packs. Another story. One of the most interesting things I remember about our time was when dad was at Boeing. This was in 1944, as I remember, and Boeing was still making the smaller bombers. He came home from work one day and told us about the new plane they were starting to put in production. It's so damn big, it'll never get off the ground. That plane was a B-29 the bomber that ended World War II. And then he writes extras for free. The article about the Hutchison base was very interesting. In the 70s, we lived in Wichita. I was a member of the Norman Lee Orchestra, and we played several dances at the Officers Club, which was one of their hangers. Then in the 80s, until I retired in 2000, I was a school administrator in Pratt. I was part of the Dixieland band, and we did several performances in the big hangar that was still standing. It has since been torn down um, because it was falling down. There was a group in Pratt that tried to save it, but failed because of the cost. And that's one thing I also wanted to mention is in Pratt, one of the, the last remaining parachute buildings um, it's on the National Register now, but it was used during World War II uh, to pack the parachutes for the pilots. Just thought I would mention that. Anyway, I thought Cleo had some great stories. Um, let's see, let's go on to the next slide. I'm so sorry. Um, and one woman sent in, she wanted to remain anonymous, but she talked about the landing ship tanks. Um, my dad was a first generation American. My grandparents came over to the United States from Austria to avoid the impending war building up in Europe. Consequently, he was very patriotic. His parents passed on to him that appreciation for this country. He wanted to sign up to serve in World War II. His brother Frank had already enlisted, but he was one day too old. Uncle Frank ended up in Normandy on D-Day, was wounded and came back 80% disabled. He was awarded the Purple Heart. Dad wanted to do something, so he packed us up and we moved to Indiana and Ohio so, th so that he could work in the shipyards and did so through the war years. I started first grade in Greensburg, Ohio, age four. I remember the deep snow that my sister and I walked through to go to school. I'd fall into the drifts and she'd reach down and pull me out. After the war, dad moved us back to Kansas. I remember how hot it seemed as we got closer to Kansas. Another interesting note was that my dad helped build the LST boats, probably one of those that landed my Uncle Frank on the beach of Normandy. And let's see, what's our next slide? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask just to take a small break. Does anyone have a story they'd like to share? Just to give my voice a break. 
I know you do. Yes, tell a story. Hop right on up here. I have lots of stories because I was second, first, second, and third, and fourth grade when my dad was in service during World War II. What is your name? My name is Sue Bush. Okay. Um, one of the things, I've done genealogy for about 50 years. And one of the things that uh, I've just found recently, because I've been able to pull up, uh, like, my dad's registration for World War II, but just recently, I found my grandfather's. And uh, my grandfather was born in August of 1877. So the story is, the US officially entered World War II on 8th December 1941, following the attack on Pearl Harbor. Just about a year before that, in October of 1940, President Roosevelt had signed into law the first peacetime selective service draft in history due to the rising world conflicts. And so then there was four waves of registration. The fourth registration, often referred to as the old man's reg registration, was conducted on 27 April 1942 and registered men who were born on or between the 28th of April, 1877, and the 15th of February, 1897. My grandfather's registration, which I have a picture of here, and it, ha it has his name, their address, and what state he was born in. He was 64 years old, has my grandmother's name, and wanted to know what his employment. He said gardening. He was retired from the railroad and he had been in the Spanish-American War. So I, I was really surprised to find that. Um, my dad uh, was in the Navy and one of the things that I wrote in, the first I remember of war, I was about four years old and walked into the bedroom. My mother was making the bed and she was crying. Well, for a four-year-old to find her mother crying, that's traumatic. And I said, what's wrong, Mom? And she said, Tommy's going to war. War meant nothing to me, but Tommy was her brother, her, old, her only brother. And Tommy did. He, he was drafted. He went in the Army. He was single, never got married. He spent the entire World War II from 42 to 45 in Bermuda, <laughs> sitting behind a desk. My dad was in the Navy. He was on his way on the bus from Topeka to Kansas City after being getting a draft notice. And a bunch of fellows started talking, hey, if we are inducted in the Army, we're going to end up in Europe, and we're going to be walking and everything. So they got off the bus and walked over to the Navy stationed and enlisted in the Navy. So uh, just lots, of, several years ago, we were in uh, Hawaii and st standing in, on the Arizona Memorial. And then the next day we went back and we're on the USS Missouri, standing where it was signed. And you can stand there and look across and see the Arizona. And it's a feeling of, I saw where it started and I'm standing on the ship where it ended, though the ship was in a different place. So uh, just some things. One more thing. You told about uh, Obama's grandmother. I went to, to high school, graduated from high school with his grandmother's brother, and we still correspond on. Oh, so. my. That's a great story. That's wonderful. Is Wanda Isles in this class? Okay, she must be taking this online. 
um, she was born and raised in Florence and um, that both sets of her grandparents were of German descent and came to Kansas to farm. Her father's family moved from Lincolnville, Kansas to Florence in 1940. They had eight children, five sons, and three daughters. Three of her father's brothers served in World War II. Kenneth and John were Marines stationed in the South Pacific. Gail was in the Army and fought in the Battle of the Bulge. Henry passed away at age 16, leaving the youngest son, my father, to help with the farming. My father, Walt, had a medical condition which prevented him from serving in any branch of the military. I can remember my father telling me how poor his family was and how hard farming became with my uncles away fighting for our country. Large families were common in our area and the children helped with the crops and the chores. My grandparents could not afford proper housing for their large family. When they purchased the farm west of Florence, it had two old railroad boxcars on the land. The family built a small room which connected the two boxcars. One car was split and served as two bedrooms for the seven children. The other boxcar contained a small kitchen and my grandparents' bedroom. One of the many memories my dad shared with me was him waking up during the winter with snow on his blanket. The boxcars were not insulated and snow drifted inside through the cracks through the wood panels. He also told me my grandmother's worst fear was receiving a telegram notifying her of a son's death in the war. Grandmother's prayers were answered when all three children, three sons returned home safely. I'm just going to add here that boxcars on farms were often a common sight in Kansas. Um, and in fact, every once in a while you can still see some of those old ones. Okay. Anyway, we can we can make comments on that later. Anyway, her grandmother made all the clothes for the family. Her favorite Christmas present one year was receiving a new pair of shoes. Her mother's family had six children, four daughters and two sons. Um, the family lived in Newton until the spring of 1943 when they bought a farm and moved to Florence. Um, in 1944, her grandfather became ill and was unable to work in the fields. My mother, who was 12 at the time, recalls three or four of the German POWs from the Peabody prisoner camp coming to their farm. There were armed guards who watched the prisoners while they worked the fields and helped the wheat harvest. My grandmother was fluent in German. She provided the noon meal to the guards and prisoners on the large screened-in porch. My mom recalls grandmother visiting with the prisoners in German. She also remembers them being very polite. Um, let's see. Both of my families had ration books and nothing went to waste. For example, my mother had several dresses which were made from feed sacks. The common saying at the time was, use it up, wear it out, or do without. Everyone worked hard and helped one another. Um, and I love this one from Sandra Cool Gordon. I grew up in a farm in Cloud County near Glasgow. I was eight when the war was over. I do not remember Pearl Harbor. I went to a one-room school a half mile from our home. I remember picking milkweed pods and having a scrap metal drive. We, brought, we bought 10 cents monthly and added the stamp to our book. A book was a war bond. I think I ha still have one in a safe deposit box. We had a big victory garden and sang victory songs like Johnny Got a Zero. My dad and his brother were considered essential industries, so they did not go into the service. I do remember when two German prisoners from the camp in Concordia came to work on the farm. Two guards came with them. We fed them in the front yard under the trees. They were very well fed. They got fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and gravy. I'm sure the vegetables were picked from the garden that morning. 
I'm sure there were side dishes and bread, though I don't remember that. I also don't remember whether my mother gave them dessert using some of her precious sugar, which was rationed. I'm guessing she did. The young men were just like young men in our neighborhood and not the monsters I expected. They were laughing and joking and all seemed to be enjoying the beautiful day. One man had a picture of a daughter who was about the age of my four-year-old cousin. She was blonde and wearing her hair in pigtails. He was watching what she did. I remember going to get the paper paperwork to be able to buy shoes. I don't remember having trouble with gas because it was essential for the machines. Sugar rationing was hard for my mother. We got my grandparents sugar because my grandfather was diabetic. After the war, we found sugar in the attic that had yellowed with age. After the war, I would come home and say, Mom, guess what? The girls have gum you can blow bubbles with. The answer was always that it was available before the war. <sighs> Several things were new to me. I love that story. Um, Steve Smith, you're here, aren't you? Yes. Do you want to share your story? And Tant, what's our next? Oh, this is a pr this is the one. This is the slide we've been waiting for. So, my my story. Uh, my father. We we were so hard up for soldiers during World War II that my father was drafted in 1943 at age 34, plus. His wife, my mom, was pregnant with me. Now, what were we doing taking somebody who was 34 year old a pregnant wife? Well, Dad had worked in a federal hospital and had a medical background, and that was considered very desirable. So he got drafted by the Navy, uh, served at a naval hospital in Sydney, Australia, two places in New Guinea with the uh, naval CBs, the construction outfits. So he was one of the first guys ashore. And then he was in the Philippines with the, the CBs again. So, you know, war ended. He came home at age two and a half. I got to see him in October of 1945. And I don't remember this, but I remember all the stories that he took me up to King's Drugstore for a vanilla ice cream cone that started a, a long fascination with ice cream. But one thing I, I you know, you hear these stories from your parents and veterans for years, and you think, man, why didn't I talk about this sooner? I asked dad one time, well, what did you get done in the Philippines? Well, such and such a time. And what did you get home? Well, he got to California in such and such a time. Well, that sounds like you're out there about 17 or 18 weeks, weren't you, dad? Yeah. Well, why did it take so long? Well, we were in the, uh, the ships that were milling around there waiting to invade Japan. And uh, I'd read about this in history that, you know, they speculated that if we would have invaded Japan, that the Japanese would have put up fierce resistance. We'd have had arm-to-arm -arm fighting and there could have been maybe, pick your number, a million Americans killed or whatever. It hit me, like somebody mentioned earlier, man, if it hadn't been for uh, the atomic bomb being dropped and Japan surrendering, I might never have seen my dad. Well, years later, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, who was the commander on the B-29, the Enola Gay, that dropped the atomic bomb over Hiroshima that led to the, uh, the Japanese surrender. Colonel Tibbetts was here at the Aviation Museum, I think this was back in 2017, and uh, he was helping raise funds for the restoration of Dock, the B-29 bomber, and you could buy one of his books and uh, meet him and he had autograph it. So I was standing in line and uh, I came up and I had my book. And I said, Colonel Tibbetts, if you'll forgive me, I know you probably heard this story a million times, but my dad was waiting out in the Pacific to go ashore on Japan. If it hadn't been for you and your men and your team, I might not have had a dad. And he kind of thought for a moment like I say, he's probably heard the story a million times. He gets up, he's a tall man, he gets up, 
he has a tear in his my his eye. I have a tear in my eye. We shake hands, and uh, I was glad he got to hear that. I think a lot of times guys in his position, especially with all the controversy about the bomb, uh, it's good for them to remember that there are people who are thankful for what happened. So that's my story. And that was absolutely true with my dad as well. Yeah. You know, it meant a lot to these guys to know that the bomb was dropped, that, you know, and certainly a lot of us would not be here <laughs> had, had uh, that not have happened. And you're right, it is controversial. Um, but um, anyway, another story that was sent in I was a little girl of five living in San Diego on December 7th, 1941. As you know, five-year-olds are blissfully unaware of things going on outside of their immediate environment. That day was a bit different, as five-year-olds can also feel the uh, fear and tension around them. And by the way, this was sent in by Rita Presnell. I was outside on our porch playing with my sister when we became aware of our parents and older neighbors talking um, animatedly and we felt that something was wrong. We went inside and asked what was going on. They told us, the Japs have bombed Pearl Harbor. I asked, where is Pearl Harbor? And my dad told me it was out in the ocean, which was an explanation to someone my age since I knew the ocean was a very short distance from our house, I was very scared. Later, I became aware of other things were related, such as blackout shades, mom helping to roll bandages, sugar and other shortages, but especially the uh, scarcity of bubble gum, the known scarcity of bubble gum. The gum which we could get was now the exorbitant price of five cents. My dad, who had been working for the post office, now had a photo booth in a downtown amusement park. There he took photos of the sailors and Marines who were wanting to send photos home before they left for war zones. San Diego was the setting off point for vast numbers of military personnel. These are the things I remember most. Um, and this was sent in by um, Carol Dean Presnell. I was in the Navy in World War II, just being called up two weeks before the bomb was dropped. My, my desire to get into the service may have been because all my classmates were in the services rather than patriotism. I was just a naive country boy. I wonder if our current citizens could come together in the spirit of patriotism as we did in the 40s. thought that was an interesting question. Uh, he talks, um, this is a rather long story, so I'm just kind of going to hit the highlights. Uh, he talks about being a sophomore at Winfield High School at the end of the war. Uh, he was in the Navy, and he, um, let's see, his mother, during World War II, my mother, a widow with three sons, worked at Boeing plant on a punch press. Um, she, she commuted from Winfield to a 10-hour second shift by either a bus or carpool. Um, during his ju junior and senior year of high school, he worked at a neighborhood gro grocery as a clerk, a butcher, and a delivery truck driver delivering groceries in Winfield and he worked with ration coupons. He remembers his most vivid memories was a misunderstanding on an order for Kotex and filling it with carpet tacks and a fender bender with the truck. I had never driven before. Upon graduation from high school, all my classmates were leaving to, for the armed services, but I was too young. Um, he took a bus to Wichita, found the Board of Education on South Broadway and, ob and obtained an underage work permit. It allowed him to get a job at Boeing in a stockroom filling part orders for the B-29. Um, let's see. Then he went to Chillicothe Business School, Business College, and then worked as a roundhouse car clerk for Frisco Railroad. Let's see. 
Let's uh, skip to the next slide. And yes, um, Wayne, I know you're here. Would you like to talk about your mom? Thank you. She, she has an incredible story, and I just absolutely loved it when you sent this in. First of all, I'd like to uh, mention that I did have three uncles that served uh, in the military during World War II. One of them uh, was in New Guinea in the Medical Corps, and then uh, another one was uh, helped liberate some of the uh, concentration camps in the uh, the uh, German-Hungary area. And then my dad and my uncle both uh, served in uh, the Battle of the Bulge and uh, that, that part of uh, Belgium. <clears throat> but my mother, while she was in uh, high school, uh, I believe it was her junior year, was involved with a campaign. Uh, she was going to Vesper High School, which is just west of Salina up there. It's uh, Lincoln, Sylvan Grove, Vesper, farming community, not a lot of people, but uh, they spent, uh, they had a campaign to uh, raise money for war bonds and uh, war stamps. And um, they were able to, in the length of that campaign, raise about $27,000 to donate to the war bond effort. Uh, the military was so uh, thankful that they ended up naming 20 or 32 Jeeps, uh, Vesper, Kansas Jeeps, uh, in their honor. And um, she was then the course the high seller and so she was named the war bond queen of the high school uh, following uh, her graduation Don't you love that <laughs> following her graduation then she did enter into the uh, nurses court nurse corps uh, with the uh, idea that they would be serving uh, in the military with the nurses and she entered at St. Francis uh, Hospital and went through about a year and a half of training before the war ended and um uh, when the war ended, my dad came back, they got married. She was kicked out of the nursing corps because married women weren't allowed to be nurses at that time. And so um, she lived happily ever after, and I know he did too. So, uh, but that's, unless you want to hear some other stories about the antics of my I, father. <laughs> I loved how much money they were able to raise and that it was named in honor. Um, I just think that's an incredible incredible story. Thank you so much. Um, now you had also mentioned about how, was it your father? One of, of how he almost got thrown into the brig. Do you want to tell that story? Cause it's kind of a cute story. My father being the uh, most rambunctious of three three brothers, um, when he was uh, stationed in Bastogne, around that area, uh, he had found out that his older brother, Everett, who was in the picture there with him, um, was he was a lieutenant and he was uh, stationed there also. And he spent several days trying to find the location where his brother was, finally fi figured out where the officer's quarters were and the officer's area was. And... Um, stormed the officer's uh, camp claiming that he was going to beat the out of this SOB, you know, he just named him by name, you know, SOB Janney, and uh, go storming in there. Well, the military police, the guards and all that grabbed him and, and, you know, just created all kinds of a hassle. And his brother was standing over in the corner and saw it and realized who it was and uh, came over. And that was their reunion in, in Bastogne. Uh, in Belgium there. I would like to mention also, though, that there was one time where he commandeered a Jeep for he and his buddy could go touring and roaming around the countryside when they had some time off, only to find out that it was one of General Bradley's personal Jeeps that was <laughs> that was stationed where they were at also. So he almost got in trouble for that one, too. That is risky business. All right, um, let's go to the next slide, see what we've got there. 
Lori, are you here today? There you are. Okay, tell us this story. I love it. Oh, I haven't talked. <laughs> so in the bottom... We, we can't blame her yet. Yeah. Yeah. In the bottom uh, right is a V-mail message that my grandfather sent back to his wife in Kanawha, Oklahoma. And my mom at the time, in 1944, grandpa was stationed in Greenland, and mom was six years old. If I had known I was going to be taking this class, I would have asked her about World War II and Grandpa years ago. Sadly, she's suffering from Alzheimer's disease. She's nonverbal, so I can't ask her any information. My personal connection with World War II came in 2007, the 65th anniversary of the Battle of Midway. Before I retired six years ago from the Great Plains Nature Center, I, was, I worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And in the upper right, you can see that there, the entrance sign is for Midway Atoll National Wildlife Refuge, which is administered and maintained by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's the Battle of Midway National Historic Memorial. And then there's also all the oceans around it that are part of a national monument as well. So there was a group of probably 18 of us from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, that flew to Midway Island, and we then greeted the veterans for a one-day ceremony at the, at the, uh, on the island. So, so there's a pillbox that's on the beach, and you can see the outline of an albatross. Midway Island is a, like I said, it's a national wildlife refuge, and there are literally thousands upon thousands of albatross that go there every year to nest, and that's why it's a protected area. I don't know if there's a next slide, but, ah. So in the upper, you can see the ship offshore and the albatross. So the, all these folks were then shipped to the island um, and they were greet with they we greeted them at the air on the uh, airstrip, and then they took a tour, and then by nightfall they were back on their on their cruise ship. So, and the picture in the middle it's kind of hard to see, but we're prepping for the ceremony. I'm on this I'm second from the right, and I'm actually wearing a WSU shirt at the time. So, anyway, woohoo! That's it. All right. 2007, the six. Right, and that's the 65th. The Battle of Midway was 1942, so two, 2007 was the 65th anniversary of the Battle of Midway, June 5th through the 7th of 1942. Excellent, thank you. Margaret Weilert, are you here with us today? All right, well, I bet you're online. My herons of World War II were my mother, also the most influential Kansas woman for me, and my aunt. When my father went to Washington State to build U.S. Navy ships and my uncle went to war in Europe, my mother and my aunt stayed home to work the farm, including dairy farming, planting, harvesting, etc., and raise four kids collectively, all under four years of age at the beginning. They continued this miracle work for three years until my dad and uncle returned home. Although we all remained in close contact for years after the war, I never heard their stories until I was middle-aged. They never, just never talked about their gallant work. And... Um, Let's see. I think I may have some more here. Um, going through here, trying to get everybody. Some of you sent in pictures of headlines. Um, certainly Calvin Hawkins did of a scrap drive taking place um, near, in, near Nebraska's great... 
let's see. Oh, their record is a challenge to all Kansans. This is the Emporia Gazette. It was about a scrap drive. Fred, Fred Eltz um, sent in this story. To the best of my knowledge, my parents had no direct connection to Kansas prior to my relocation here in 1995 after I had worked on both the U.S. East Coast and overseas, Jordan, Egypt, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates. My parents did both serve in the military during World War II, so my comments below will provide a very brief overview of what I know about their experiences. I will start with my father's side of the family. My father's father, my grandfather, immigrated to the U.S. in 1923 from Germany and settled in Scranton, Pennsylvania. My grandmother, father, and uncle subsequently immigrated in 1926. My grandparents, having born in Germany, were deeply affected by the war, but knew there was no alternative. My grandfather had been in the German army in World War I, fighting in Poland and Russia. My grandmother had six siblings in Germany, three of whom died or were killed during the war as a result of the uh, Allied bombing. She feared for their safety, did not, did not learn of their deaths until my father came back after the war had ended and told her about them. My father was drafted in the U.S. Army in 1942 while attending graduate school. He started as a private, eventually became a master sergeant, and later received what was called a battlefield commission as a second lieutenant. He ended the war and left the Army in 1946 as a first lieutenant. Before D-Day in Normandy, my father fought in North Africa and Italy at the Battle of Monte Cassino before landing in Normandy. My father later recounted one of the most memorable recollections was of the Battle of Monte Cassino in Italy. They, there, the Germans stopped a full U.S. Army Corps, 45,000 men, for almost three months. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, my mother's involvement is more brief, not because it was less impactful or important, but rather um, because I'm less knowledgeable. Uh, during World War II, following her graduation from Wellesley College in the U.S. Uh, Navy waves as a second lieutenant from 1944 to 1946, her specific responsibilities during this time in the waves were confidential, and she maintained this confidentially throughout the remainder of her life, despite my brothers and my repeated requests and cajoling to provide us with more insight. I thought that was interesting. Cheryl Morris, are you here? She sent in um, that she knows World War II had a considerable impact on her family. Her father enlisted with a group from Chase, Kansas after Pearl Harbor. She has a very old Chase newspaper article with all the names and pictures of those leaving. Her dad died back here on uh, May 15, 1953, when she was a year and eight months old. I think his reaction to the war and the effect on my parents' marriage contributed to his death. His brother told me that my dad was a courier. She has his briefcase, and he rode a motorcycle all over England or France. Unfortunately, when she tried to obtain more information from the Army, his records had been lost in the St. Louis fire. Her great-aunt Mildred, on her mother's side, was a missionary in the Philippines. She spent the war as a Japanese POW. She was a child, I was a child when she died, and have not heard of anyone researching this. I remember she always typed everything since she had arthritis so badly in her hands due to her imprisonment. Her first father-in-law was assigned to a code-breaking unit. He would tell me of some of the concerns they dealt with. Her second father-in-law grew up in the rural areas around Wichita, and he was employed 90% of his working life at Boeing. 
Uh, she grew up in Hutt. If you could please turn your phones off. We're almost done with class. I so appreciate it. Um, let's see. She grew up around Hutch, Great Bend, Concordia, Lyons, Sterling, Salina, and Wichita. And her daughter-in-law worked for Love Box and Coleman. And she and her husband were married, her first husband, were married in the chapel at Salina's Camp Phillips. I love that. Um, I am thinking we still have many more stories to go, but I may save those for next time if that's okay with you. And I'm hoping if any of you have any more insights that you'd like to share, please do. Um, I do have maybe a question or two that I'd love to ask you to think about for maybe next time. And that is what insights maybe that you've had about your family about World War II after listening to some of these stories? And what impresses you most about Kansas's involvement during the war? Now, I may shade it just a little bit, but I'm going to say, you know, I've covered this from, you know, with different anniversaries and stories through the years. But I am always impressed with the involvement of many of these people. Many of them were just farm kids. And yet the things that they did that were so impressive. And so I want you to think about that for next time. Any comments or questions that any of you have right now? All right. Well, I'll see you next time. Thank you so much.